and we're live. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, from a short lunch break. Uh, I hope uh, you guys are refreshed for the energetic afternoon that we have ahead of us. Uh, my name is Guillaume Lajoie. I'll be chairing uh, the afternoon session. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, um, afternoon coming up uh, ahead of us. So we have talks by um, uh, Dr. Alona Fisch, Dr. Ian Charret, Dr. Beckett Ebbets, and a keynote by Dr. Eve Martyr, followed by a Q&A session uh, um, uh, chaired by uh, Sarah Sola, where essentially the idea is to talk about the field of neuro AI, where it's come from, where it's going, and particularly the challenges of being a new trainee in this, in this ever-evolving uh, environment. Um, so without f further ado, let me introduce our first speaker of the, uh, of the afternoon. So uh, our first speaker is uh, Alona Fish. She's an assistant professor with a joint appointment at the Departments of Computing Science and Psychology at the University of Alberta. She received her PhD in machine learning from Carnegie Mellon University and holds a Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, otherwise known as CIFAR, Artificial Intelligence Chair. She's also a fellow, uh, fellow in the Learning um, in Machines and Brain. Uh, uh, it's a program also at CIFAR. Uh, and a fellow at the Alberta Machine Learning Intelligence Institute, Amy. Her research interests regroup computational linguistics, machine learning, and neuroscience, and her work combines all three of these areas to study the way human brains processes languages. So without further ado, Alona, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Let me just share my screen. Okay, does this look good? Yes. Great. Okay, I'm excited to be here. Um, I was uh, listening in in the morning and it's been a great set of talks so far. I'm looking forward also to today and tomorrow's talks. Uh, it's a great program, I'm happy to be part of it. Today I'm gonna to talk to you, to you about what um, I think it might be a bit of an out there idea, but the one that I'm really excited about and I hope to convince you that it's actually a pretty good idea. Um, how can we use brain images to constrain model training or what I like to call brain constrained learning? Uh, so today's talk has two parts, and the two parts are um, work that I did quite a long time ago in 2000, I think the paper was published 2014, and then work that I uh, uh, completed just recently, but that I've never presented on before. So uh, wish me luck here as I present old work that has long passed in my mind and new work that I've never talked about. Um, and this was all inspired by um, uh, intro to Cog Psych class that I had to take, uh, uh, sorry, teach uh, last year. Um, and where we talked about Mars levels of analysis. So you may be familiar with Mars levels of analysis. They are uh, computational, algorithmic, and implementational. And they are a way to compare what two information processing systems are. So we can compare them at the computational level and talk, talk about uh, whether they share their highest level goals, their, what the, the problem they're trying to solve. At the algorithmic level, that tells us something about how they solve the problem. And at the implementational level, what we're talking about is the actual hardware they use to solve that problem. So when we train machine learning models, often what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, solve some high level computational goal. And we're trying to train a program to do something that the brain can do. So let's say that we restrict our uh, focus right now to one of the many, many, many tasks that the brain can do, which is just simple object detection. You see a picture and you identify the object that's in the picture. Of course, we can also train neural networks to do that same object detection task. And so when we think about the two information processing systems, one being the brain and one being a neural network trained for object detection, they share that high level computational goal. They share the goal of object detection. And so the asterisk here is just because the brain can do much more than object detection, of course. So then we can move down these Mars levels of analysis into the algorithmic and implementational levels. And so on the algorithmic level, do we know how the brain does object detection? Uh, I think we have a very, fairly large question mark here. There's lots of details that we uh, believe we have uncovered at this point, but there's lots that we still don't know. And then when it comes to a neural network, do we know the algorithm that a neural network uses to do object detection? Um, on some level we do in that we can, it's just a series of uh, functions chained together. We certainly can write down that function and tell you exactly how we went from input pixels to the predicted uh, object in the image. But it's also a question mark in that it's not actually like a, a describable algorithm that either you or I would really be able to explain to anyone else or even understand ourselves. And then at the bottom level, at the implementational level, of course, the brain operates using neurons. 
and the neural network operates using transistors that uh, reside on a CPU or a GPU. So clearly, uh, these two models share something at the top level, and they will never share anything at the bottom level um, as long as we use computers that use transistors. So the question is, um, what can we do in the middle? So can we um, use something about the algorithm that the brain is using to uh, guide a neural network in its training process? So um, the brain is an example of a model, uh, a computational uh, system that does object detection very well. And so uh, it is one example of a solution to this problem that we might want to use to uh, constrain the neural network as it searches for another solution to the problem. Uh, it's of course true that we don't need to use the same algorithm in a neural network that the brain uses to do object detection, but it is also true that the brain is one extant example of an algorithm uh, that does this uh, task very well. And so I, I want to think about what we have presented as largely a false barrier. Uh, to doing this sort of work. So what is the brain's algorithm for object detection? Uh, so it's true that we understand parts of this algorithm, I think at this point we have some idea about how we go from the low level pixels on the screen that we might observe all the way up to our own perception of what's in the, the image that we're being shown. Um, large parts of that algorithm are, are unknown and unsolved. So at some point we get some so to some place in this algorithm, we don't know what's going on anymore. So the question I talked about, about today is, do we need to know the brain's algorithm to benefit from it? And so today I hope to be able to convince you uh, that the answer to that question is no. We don't actually need to know what the brain is doing in order to improve neural networks based on what the brain is doing. So if we go back to our Mars level of analysis, we can, we can uh, detect what Mike Dawson calls the artifacts of the algorithm. So the algorithm is happening in the brain and we can record neural activation or using braid images. And that tells us something about the algorithm as it progresses. So we're able to detect artifacts of the algorithm as it progresses. And those artifacts of the algorithm tell us something about what the algorithm is. And in a similar way, we can do that for neural networks as well. So we have the ability to detect artifacts of the algorithm as we go from pixels to final prediction. And those artifacts of the algorithm are those hidden representations at each layer of a convolutional neural network. Those hidden units represent some of the intermediate stages during processing. They represent some of the things that are computed on the way from pixels to prediction. So can we sort of use these two intermediate stages and match them together in a way that improves neural network training uh, in the final trained neural network? So it's been alluded to several times already today, and most of you are probably aware that there, it's true that these artifacts, artifacts of the algorithm are already aligned to some degree. So it's true that even though brains, uh, sorry, neural networks don't know anything about the brain, uh, there's some structure that's imposed by us, uh, might have been inspired at the brain at some, at some point, but um, largely it doesn't have anything to do with the brain, doesn't have any knowledge of the brain, yet its intermediate representations actually are a fairly good match to the brain, for example, in vision. So the hidden representations that a CNN learns actually match fairly well to the hierarchy of the visual system in the primate brain. And it's been shown across several uh, different studies. The same is actually true also in language. There's been multiple studies that show that uh, computational models of language meaning, both at the word and the sentence level, um, are a fairly good match to the human brain reading those same stimuli. Uh, so this has also been shown across several different studies. So what does that mean? What does that tell us? So the artifacts of the algorithm already align, which means that the, in their final trade, trained state, these models actually are computing intermediate representations that re resemble brain activation. So the question is, so if these trained models, once we've trained them, end up in a space in the sort of uh, high dimensional uh, space of parameters that they could end up in, they end up in a space that computes artifacts of the algorithm that look a lot like the brain's artifacts look. So is it possible that we could train models even better if we supplied signals of brain imaging during training? So that's the general idea behind two, the two halves of today's talk. And um, I'm hoping to show you today, convince you that the answer to this question is yes, we can train better models if we supply those models with some uh, signal about um, brain imaging during training. And I'm gonna show you this is true for both language and vision. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about um, a work of mine from long ago and far away, um, back when I was doing my PhD at Carnegie Mellon. 
Uh, and this is joint work with Partha uh, Telukdar, Brian Murphy, and Todd Mitchell. So in order to tell you about this work, first I need to tell you about single um, models of single word meaning. So you may be familiar with the word vectors, but if you're not, I'll just give you a quick crash course in them. So words that are used in the same context um, often share a meaning. So if I give you a particular sentence and you could swap a word in and out of a, that sentence without changing the meaning by very much, then those, those words must share some meaning. And so that's the general idea behind um, that. I, the general idea behind uh, models of semantics for single words. So words that are used in the same context often share meaning. Uh, so we're, we're going to look for words that are associated with the word of interest. So if we're interested in the word apple, we're going to look nearby that word and look for words that often appear with the word apple. So we might find that ap apple often appears with the word seed, but less often with the word salad, though of course there are salads with apples in them. Um, and we might see that, well, apple is actually quite similar to pear. Uh, pears often occur with the word seed, for example, less often in salads, or maybe equally often in salads um, compared to apples. So maybe apples and pears share something in common. So there are uh, a long history of models built on this idea, going all the way back to 1997 with LSA, which is perhaps one of the most famous models in this space, was uh, picked up in psychology and used to this day uh, to represent word meaning. And then maybe a more popular recent model based on neural networks is word to uh, which you might be familiar with. Both of these models use the general idea that uh, words that appear in similar contexts share something uh, in their meaning. So the corpus that we use for this study uh, is 16 billion words across 50 million documents, and it's just web pages uh, downloaded from the internet, a, a web crawl. And what we're doing is we're looking for, at a very high level, and I'm, I'm skipping over many, many details here, we're looking for word co-occurrence in, in sentences. So every time we see some word W1 near some other word W2, we're going to increment a count that we have in a giant matrix. Here, that matrix, the rows correspond to words, and the columns correspond to words. So we're going to look up word 1 in the rows and word 2 in the columns, and we'll increment that count. And so eventually we're going to end up with a very big matrix that tells us how often we saw each pair of words together in a context in our big corpus. So that's what this diagram represents. We start with some, I'm assuming you can see my cursor. Um, we start with some, these books represent a corpus. Uh, that information goes into this co-occurrence statistics calculation, and this ends up uh, results in a really big matrix with 10,000 rows, 10,000 columns. Um, so we often do dimensionality reduction like SVD to make a smaller matrix that we call a vector space model, VSM, a vector space model of semantics. And so this gray matrix uh, here I represent uh, with the letter X. Uh, what SVD essentially does is it computes two matrices. It actually computes three, but you can think of it as two, two matrices A and D such that the product approximates the uh, previous um, the input matrix X, and this will be important in a minute. So if we think of human thought as generating a bunch of different things, but one of them is written language, um, and another it could be that it generates brain activity, which we can record, we can think of putting both of those pieces of information into the same vector space model. So the written language is represented by the corpus co-occurrence statistics, Brain activity can be represented with fMRI. And we're going to put both of those pieces of information, both of those signals that tell us something about how human thought is organized into the same vector space model of semantics. So to do this, we need brain imaging data. So the brain imaging data here is uh, people viewing single words with line drawings. There are 60 concrete nouns, and they view a word and a picture at the same time. So they see like the word dog and a picture of a dog, a line drawing of a dog. And there's nine participants for which we collected MEG data and nine participants for which we collected fMRI data. Those nine participants are actually disjoint. There's no overlap between them. And this is from uh, Sudre et al. 2012 and Mitchell et al. 2008 papers. So it's important to note that this uh, data is not intersubject aligned in any way. The MEG data is not aligned, the fMRI data is not aligned, and they are not aligned to each other. There's no notion of which voxel in person one corresponds to which voxel in person two, which corresponds to which MEG sensor time point in person three. There's no such alignment. It's also true that MEG and fMRI are very different data sources. So uh, fMRI, you're probably aware, is a uh, like a 3D picture of a brain activation at a particular point in time, whereas MEG is more like a movie of brain image, uh, brain activity as it evolves over time. 
So we're going to combine these two pieces of information, these two ways of measuring brain activity, together with corpus co-occurrence data in order to produce a better, hopefully, model of word meaning. So we talked about before that um, our corpus data X can be approximated by the product of two matrices A and D. And I actually think for the purposes of what I'm about to explain, it's a little easier to think of D as a mapping. So rather than A uh, matrix A multiplied by matrix D gives us X, we can think of D as a mapping that takes the matrix X, the corpus co-occurrence matrix X and maps it down into a latent space A. So to remind you the corpus data X has thousands of words for rows and thousands of words for columns. We're gonna learn some matrix D that maps that large, that high dimensional uh, vector space down into something that's more compact. And so the matrix A will have the same number of rows as matrix X, um, but it will have fewer columns. And some subset now, some subset of those rows in A will also uh, correspond to brain imaging data that we've collected. So for example, with the data that we have here, we have 60 words. So 60 of the rows of A will have uh, brain imaging data. So that will represent with this matrix Y. Uh, so Y has the same number of um, rows as this subset of brain data here, A prime. So this has a, the size of A prime words for rows. And then the columns here, if it's fMRI data, would be voxels. So on the order of 20,000 voxels. And so what we're going to do is learn another mapping now that takes the brain data Y and maps it to a subset of the rows in A. And so we're going to name that matrix D superscript B, where B is brain, and we may name the other matrix D superscript C, where C is corpus. And so now we have two mapping constraints. We're saying that all of the rows in A need to map onto the corpus co-occurrence statistics, and some subset of those rows in A also need to map onto brain imaging data. So we can write down, write this down mathematically. So essentially we have uh, two sets of constraints. We have our corpus co-occurrence statistics. We would like it, um, all the rows of A to explain corpus co-occurrence statistics for the, the corresponding words um, through some mapping matrix DC and the uh, some subset W prime of the rows of A need to also explain the brain imaging data Y using a different mapping matrix D superscript B. I also have a sparsity constraint here, which I, I'm not going to talk about today. So the basic idea here is um, all of the rows have to explain the corpus data. Some of the rows have to explain the brain data. And that allows us to use unpaired data. So it's not we're not required to go out and collect brain imaging data for every row of uh, A, for every possible word, uh, which is great because it's expensive and time consuming to collect brain imaging data. Uh, so here we just need to have a mapping for some subset of the words. And we can use that subset of the words to, to build this constraint. And the information from the corpus um, can uh, help shape all the words. And then a subset of the words will also be shaped by the brain imaging data. OK, some just little details about the optimization. This is an online dictionary learning algorithm. So we're going to solve for B, D, B, and D, C with gradient descent, and then solve for A uh, just using typical lasso regression. So this is an uh, alternating method of solving for these two uh, sets of matrices, uh, one at a time, back and forth. Okay, so now we're going to use the, um, the vector space model that we trained using brain imaging data to test to see how it performs on a decoding task. So we're going to try to tell what word a person is reading based on their brain imaging data. And then we're going to compare that to the typical way of doing this where we don't include brain imaging data in order to do the uh, matrix factorization to, to find that matrix A. So the typical way to do this is using just text in this first step. There's no brain imaging data in this first step. We have some corpus co-occurrence statistics X. Some magic happens here that's matrix factorization. And we get out our vector space model A. And then we take some subset of this rows and we would test on um, some brain imaging data uh, using some classification framework to see if we can tell what word a particular person is reading based um, on their brain imaging data captured at a particular point in time. So I'm not going to go into the details of uh, everything I've put in box here, boxes here, but you can um, think of it as decoding. Can we tell what person a word is, <laughs> what, person, what word a person is reading based on their brain imaging data um, by predicting the, the dimensions of a vector space model? 
And so the way that we measure how well we can do that is using two versus two accuracy. And just like normal accuracy, higher is better. Chance in this case is 50-50. So now we're gonna change this framework to include brain imaging data in the top. So now we'll use one participant's brain imaging data in the top, uh, S1. Um, their brain imaging data will go into this matrix factorization algorithm and we'll get out some a new matrix A that is dependent on participant S1, their data. And this uh, subset of the rows A prime are the 60 words that correspond to the words in our um, brain imaging data set. So we'll take that subset of the 60 words representation and put it into the second step where we have uh, every other participant. Um, we will test these uh, this vector space model against every other participant in the same way using this classification framework to see, can we tell what word a person is reading at a particular point in time? We'll measure that using two versus two accuracy. So I wanna point out an important point here, which is that um, if we use participant S1 in the top step, we will not test with participant S1 in the second step. So we're not sort of double dipping here. We're not using the same brain to train the model that we're using the test on. Okay, so the results for this uh, look like this. Uh, so the green bars here correspond to the accuracy for the decoding task. Um, when we include fMRI in dark green or MEG in light green, and this is decoding based on fMRI data. And the, the yellow here is uh, not using any brain imaging data at all. And the red line is the typical SVD algorithm that was popular at the time for doing this uh, matrix factorization of co-occurrence statistics. So uh, it's clear that the um, including brain imaging data improves performance. And it's also interesting that um, it improves performance, though we're testing on fMRI data, we can include either MEG or fMRI data and see a, perf a performance improvement. So even though the, this data is not aligned across participants, it's also completely different recording modalities. We can still use that brain imaging data to improve uh, the decoding task for an additional uh, participant. Um, so I basically already said this, the performance is better even though we haven't done any aligning of the brains across participants. And of course, MEG and fMRI are very different. So uh, I used brain images to improve prediction for other brain images. Um, that's actually not what I promised you. Um, you. What I promised you is that we were going to improve word models in a more holistic sense. We were gonna make um, the final model better. So I've shown you that the final model is better, but only for decoding brain images um, from other people. So that could mean that specifically we're picking something up in brain images that doesn't really have anything to do with, say, word meaning itself in a more holistic sense. Um, so the way that word models are often tested in a more holistic sense is that they ask people to give judgments of uh, something to do with word meaning. So they can ask how similar two words are, or they can ask you to rate something about a particular word, say how positive or negative it is. And so here, um, the behavioral data that we used is the answers to 218 semantic questions about the words. So for the 60 words, we collected 218 semantic questions. Those semantic questions are things like, is it alive and can it bend? And then we're gonna calculate um, that pairwise distance between words in that 218 dimensional space. And we're gonna compare that pair, those pairwise distances to the pairwise distances in the brain constrained vector space model and also the non-brain constrained vector space model. So here we're asking when we compare to essentially what it is that people tell us about words, when we ask them questions about the words, does that, do those answers, the correlation between those answers for two words match the correlation between um, the vector space models representations for those two words? So when we look at the results here, uh, we see a similar pattern that um, the green bars, which are fMRI and MEG, um, are higher than not including the brain imaging data um, during the training of the vector space model. So um, I've shown you that in a more holistic sense, uh, including brain imaging data actually does improve vector space models of semantics. Uh, so you might think, well, like matrix factorization, who cares about that? Um, this has been shown to also work for a neural network, neural network model like word to vec uh, more recently. And it's also been shown to work in a similar sort of flavor, has been shown to work for transformers uh, more recently, 2019. So the idea that we can include brain imaging data into a model of language and improve that model's performance on a whole set of tasks, including decoding tasks, um, has been studied. Uh, and been shown to uh, 
appear to work. And so this is one piece of evidence that we can use brain imaging data to constrain training uh, and improve models. So now we're going to turn to vision. Ask now, instead of a language question, we're going to ask, can we improve convolutional neural networks or CNNs using brain imaging data? So we can take brain images while an animal views images. Can we use recordings of that brain to improve how a convolutional neural network uh, learns to do something like object detection? So here's a typical convolutional neural network um, overview diagram. So on the left-hand side, we have our input image. And this model learns to do convolutions with learned filters. Those filters become feature maps, which go on with subsampling and subsequent convolutions to become other feature maps, so on and so forth, until we get to the final output, which is the prediction of the object that's in the input image. So at each one of these points, we can think of these as the hidden representations of the CNN. And as I said before, these hidden representations correlate to um, the primate, primate visual system. Um, here's an example of how this uh, looks in humans. Uh, so here are uh, areas of the visual system on the x-axis. On the y-axis is something like correlation. Uh, so how well can we predict the hidden representation from the uh, particular brain area? And as we move from the earliest layers of this convolutional neural network, so CNN1 up through CNN8, we see a shifting in the distribution of how well these different brain areas correlate uh, to the layers of the CNN. So for very early layers, we see a higher correlation for the lower visual areas. But then as we move into the more complex, higher order uh, CNN layers, we start to see a shift towards the more uh, higher order um, visual areas, uh, correlating better to those the representations in those higher uh, CNN layers. So there's sort of this match between um, not just what is computed, but sort of the order in which things are computed uh, you know, across the layers of the neural network and the visual system hierarchy. So can brain recordings regularize convolutional neural networks? That's the general idea. We know that they match after training if, they, if the convolutional neural network knows nothing about uh, the visual system. So the question is, if we use some information about the visual system uh, recorded using brain imaging techniques, can we constrain uh, the learning problem so that we get a better final solution. So this is joint work uh, with Joel Zilberberg, as who's at York in Toronto, uh, and his uh, student Callie Federer, who was at the University of Colorado, and Hao Yan Shu, who was my student at the University of Alberta. So the data we use here is actually in anesthetized monkeys, and they recorded um, spiking activity of neurons in V1 with a multi-electrode array. There are 10 experimental sessions across three different animals. And the monkeys were shown 270 static nat natural images. Uh, so the images look something like this, um, this here. And that we're going to use uh, as our neural network to be constrained a network called Cornet Z. Cornet Z is nice for this in that it's actually built to look something like the visual system. So it's not trained with um, brain imaging data, but it in uh, historically, but um, it does sort of have a structure that's uh, meant to be something like uh, the visual system. So we have like a V1 layer, V2, V3, IT, all the way up until we're making our final, final object prediction about what's in the image. We're going to train on CIFAR 100 data. So that's um, 100 object classes uh, and across images. So here's the input to our two different uh, computational uh, information processing systems. If you remember back to Mars hierarchy, uh, we're going to show our neural network some images. We're going to show the same images to the monkey, or rather, I should say, since this is publicly available data, somebody else showed these images to the monkey. We're going to show the same images to our neural network. And we're going to record the hidden unit activation um, for, in this example, in V1. We're going to write down those hidden unit activations for each one of the images. And we'll do the same thing for the monkey data. For each one of the image, images, we'll record the firing rate vectors. And so now we have representations for each one of the images that come from the neural network and representations that come for each one of the images from the monkey. So we can compute for those two uh, vectors, uh, representation similarity matrices, um, which you might be familiar with. Uh, essentially what we do is just compute the cosine similarity between each one of the vectors. Um, and we get essentially what is a a similarity matrix for the images in neural network space and the images in the monkey brain space. 
And so we're going to train the neural network to minimize categorization errors, just like we would for any typical uh, CNN. But now we're going to introduce a new term to the loss, where we also introduce a brain constraint, where we say not only do you need to minimize categorization errors, but the hidden representations that you learn need to look like uh, the neural representations in a monkey. And by look like here, all I mean is that um, if an image, uh, two images are similar, uh, uh, sorry, evoke similar uh, activation patterns in a monkey, monkey's brain, then those two uh, activation patterns in the hidden representation need to also be similar. So when it comes down to the actual um, writing out of this constraint, we take the essentially the similarity between images I and J in monkey space, and we subtract from that the similarity between images I and J in neural network hidden unit space. We take the difference of those in squared, so it's just like a squared loss. Um, and we're just going to introduce this into the typical loss function, cross entropy loss function that we would usually use to train a neural network. And we have a regularization parameter here. I call it lambda. So if the if the images are close in brain space, they should be close in neural network space, and of course vice versa. If they're far apart, very dissimilar in brain space, they should also be dissimilar in the neural network's representational space. So using this new loss function, we can actually um, test the training of the models. And we do see a small but robust uh, improvement in this uh, in model performance um, for different, uh, this R here is the regularization parameter from the, the previous slide that was lambda. Uh, so R0 would mean that we're not including brain imaging data at all. And as we um, include more and more brain imaging data, we see um, you know, that it becomes more accurate and then of course a little less accurate as the constraint becomes too strong. So the differences in performance here, they're small, but they're robust. Uh, but there are other interesting things that come when we do this classification, sorry, we do this training. One of the neat things is that um, without any additional constraint other than the brain imaging data, we actually end up with mistakes or misclassifications that are more often in this correct superclass. So here for R0, not including any brain imaging data, um, this on the y-axis is the number of errors that are within the correct superclass. So although it made an error, the error is not so bad because at least it's in the correct superclass. Um, that um, the number of errors that are in the correct superclass actually grows um, as we introduce this brain constraint. So the brain constraint improves classification just on a, a zero one loss, but it also improves classification if we consider that if it's a mistake, it's a better mistake or a less worse mistake, I guess. It also makes the models more corrupt to, to uh, more robust to corrupt labels. So if we corrupt some of the labels during training, uh, the models will uh, be more robust to that noise if we include brain imaging data. So here R0 again is not including any brain imaging data and R.1 is including brain imaging data. And you can see there's a significant difference between the test set accuracy. Okay, so that was quick and a lot. Uh, hopefully it, it landed well. So I've shown you that in several instances we can use brain imaging data to tell us something about how the brain solves a problem. I've shown you that this works for both language and vision and we can use those brain imaging data sets to constrain models as they are trained to do some task. Um, and so I hope that this shows you that it's actually not necessary for us to wait until we know what the brain's algorithm is for something in order to improve a neural network's model for doing the same thing. Um, so if we return back to uh, Mars levels, um, we, we share the object detection, the high level computational goal. We're never gonna share this implementational goal. And we actually don't need to know what this question mark is, but we can record something about the artifacts of the algorithm and use it to constrain the artifacts of the neural network algorithm and end up with better performance across many different dimensions. Okay, that's all I have. And I will also thank my many sponsors and take questions if there are any. All right, thank you for the great talk, Alona. Um, we are running a little bit low on time, but yeah, we'll sorry. have a time for a few questions. So I'm going to read some from you from the, the question and answer here. So there's a, um, a first question from Pierre Bellec, um, which I think you've addressed, but uh, the question goes as follows. So when you say we can use brain imaging uh, to help train ANNs, you mean to train to learn better representations that better match human brain representations or help them just better at task? So I think, you know, your goal is to make them better at task, but the question stands, right? Do you get representations then that are 
during more reminiscence of as, uh, human representations. That's a good question. We didn't explicitly test that in the in the second uh, task in the vision task, uh, but it is true for the language test that we actually did explicitly test that they are. At least the, the representations are more predictable from brain imaging data from other people. So you could say they are a better match. I see. I see. Uh, lovely. So Pierre has asked a bunch of different paper, uh, questions referring to some of your papers. Let me pick one uh, from somebody else. Maybe you can connect with Pierre uh, uh, another time. So um, here's a question here from, I'm not qu quite sure who. Um, do the improvements result extend beyond the 600 words or 270 images containing classes? Yeah, so our the work for um, the 60 words, we did show that um, it actually did improve uh, the results for some of the representations outside mm -hmm. of the 60 words, but I would say that the improvement is much stronger for the words for which we have brain imaging data. Uh, so I would say that that's future work to make sure that the brain imaging data, though we only have it for a subset of the words, is able to properly um, shape the representations for all of the words. Lovely. All right. And I, I have one quick question for myself, actually. For some of your plots in your earlier work, it seemed like adding more uh, latent dimensions did fared worse, right? Like they seem to be sweet spot at around 500. Do you have any insights as to why this would happen or? Um, yeah, I think it might end up um, starting to represent things in the brain that aren't, um, are not sort of generalizable is all I could think of. It's starting to fit maybe person specific things. Uh, it's using those extra dimensions to record things that aren't um, as useful for the actual uh, task for other people or for the more holistic behavioral tasks. That's mm. it, yeah, I guess. Cool. Very cool. All right. Fascinating. We'll have to wrap this up now. So we'll just switch speakers. Thank you again, Alona, and we'll see you in